Well, welcome everyone. For those of you who don't know me, I am Allison Blake. I'm the Executive Director of the Abilene Union Chamber of Commerce. And I appreciate everybody coming out on this snowy spring day to join us and, and hear what our legislators have to say. We're going to start this morning with Representative Barker and Senator Hardy. And then um, they're going to share their thoughts with us and probably allow you guys to ask a couple questions. And then um, probably a little closer to 11 o'clock, then Congressman Marshall will be joining us and sharing his thoughts. He had another function before this one, so he's going to come over here. So without further ado, I'm going to kind of just leave it as, a, as an open uh, format and let these guys do their thing. So mm -hmm. welcome, everybody. Thank you. I'm going to go first here. Go ahead. Okay. Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming on this yucky morning. Um, Randall Hardy, your state senator. Uh, and I, for those of you who may or may not know, I, my Senate district is all of Saline County and then the northern half of Dickinson County. Uh, 19th on the 1900th Avenue is the official dividing line uh, just south of town here. So I have the, the cities of Solomon, Chapman, Enterprise, and Abilene in my district. Uh, Senator Wilborn, Rick Wilborn, has the southern half of the district. And uh, so he, you know, he, we go back and forth some. So if there's a uh, bill that is important to Dickinson County, we'll both jump on it and uh, help each other. Um, but officially, this part of the district belongs to me. So I, I, I claim, uh, I spend more, most of my time in this area. Um, and I, I thought I would just open up uh, first by saying that I have a list over on the table. I have a weekly newsletter during the session, and uh, I send it out usually on Monday morning. And if uh, you're interested, if you're not receiving my newsletter, uh, and you're interested, you're welcome to sign up over there. I have 600 people uh, that I send it to every week now. Uh, my goal is to have 6,000 people uh, getting the newsletter. And it, it, it tells you everything that's going on. Every bill, it, I mean, some people think it's information overload. Uh, but every bill I vote on, I tell you how I voted, and, uh, if, it, uh, there, uh, and if it needs an explanation, I'll, I'll tell you that as well. So uh, that's, that's my one order of business that uh, you might want to take advantage of. Uh, I thought I would start out with, what does a senator do for Abilene and Chapman and Solomon and Enterprise? And, um, you know, you have your representative, Barker, here, and, you know, he, uh, you're more familiar with him, perhaps, and uh, you know he's he's kind of the, the tradition here in in Abilene and uh, the rest of Dickinson County, and he does a good job. But uh, I'm I decided, you know what? If I'm in this job, I want to uh, do the best job I can for the people of Dickinson County, and uh, because everybody expects me to to work for Saline County, and that's that's okay too. Uh, but I, I did a little uh, tally at the end of uh, 2018, and I, I saw that I had made 28 trips to Abilene during the course of 2018. And, and to me, that, that's, it didn't really surprise me, although the, the number did sound like, wow, that's, that's quite a few times. Uh, considering I'm in session between January and May, and I'm not, my travel is a little more limited. Uh, but that's, that was important to me, and it was important to me uh, because I feel like I need to stay connected with the people in Dickinson County, and specifically, mostly with Abilene, but uh, that's the way that I, I, I get to know what's important uh, to the people here. And uh, during the course of the session, though, I am working uh, with people in the city. Uh, you may not see it happen, but... Uh, I worked with uh, Leah Hearn, the treasurer. Uh, I worked with Jim Gartland uh, with the National Graham Association. I worked with uh, Don Hammond with the uh, Eisenhower Foundation, and that's a bill that uh, Representative Barker's working on, and also uh, a co-sponsor of the bill in the Senate uh, was Rick Wilborn and uh, Senator Bowers from Concordia. Um, I worked with uh, Austin Gilly, in the city, city manager's uh, office and uh, Tim Schaefer. Uh, I've worked, uh, worked with the uh, county commission. I've worked with uh, uh, Sherry Massey, uh, works for the Dickinson County uh, NIT on a, a 911 bill that uh, was uh, being debated in the Senate. I've uh, visited with every school superintendent. Uh, I'll meet with every school, su school superintendent uh, and their school boards uh, during the 
usually during the fall to, to ascertain what their priorities are. I meet with uh, city governments, uh, everyone that, that, that's incorporated and, in the district uh, to determine what their priorities are. So it's a lot of fun for me to get to know the uh, people in the, in the different cities. Um, and Allison here at the chamber, uh, I, uh, I, have, I feel like I have a good relationship. I was at the chamber dinner back in February. That was my first trip uh, to Abilene uh, for the year. And I, I visit, uh, last, last year I was here for ribbon cuttings, I was at Love's, I was at Land Pride. Uh, I, I did some of the uh, business after hours. Uh, you know, it, it, I enjoy it. Uh, this job's a blast, you know, I, I, have, to, I have to say. Um, and then there's something else I'm going to do. Tomorrow I'm going to be at um, Village Manor. Village Manor, that's right. <laughs> And uh, there's a, a gentleman by the name of Evan Engel, and I'm going to give him this birthday card. I call it, it's a birthday card on steroids. It's a Senate tribute. He's turning 103, and uh, anyone that turns 100 in my district, or better, um, I try to visit them and, and present them with one of these. And uh, I tell you what, every time I've done this, it's made my day. There was uh, one, uh, one gentleman I visited last, uh, the end of the year last year, over in Solomon. And uh, the, it was at the, the high school gymnasium where they were having the reception. And uh, so I was, I was there talking to people and I see this guy walking in, he had a cane. But that was it. He lived across the street from the high school, just walked across. And that, he was the recipient. And so I, we were sitting there together. And I, as, when I stood up to make the presentation, he stood up with me and put his arm around me. And it, was, uh, it was a lot of fun. So, uh, I've, I've also done that. Um, I uh, have pages from this area that come and uh, spend a day in Topeka, learn about Kansas history. They get to uh, go up to the top of the dome, uh, help me in the Senate chamber. Uh, I've had, uh, I had my first shadow this year. Uh, there was a uh, person that was uh, he's connected to 4-H actually, and uh, he came in and just followed me around all day long. And it was it was kind of fun. that was, that was kind of a revelation to me because he was he's very interested in government and we we were going out in the rotunda and uh, typically in the rotunda every day is a different kind of day uh, this particular day was uh, recycling and so you couldn't I couldn't hit didn't have time to hit all the tables and I was just going you know hit and miss and uh, he he grabbed me by the sleeve and he kind of go back to this one table you have constituents back there. I said, all right, well, this is, guys, uh, I like this one. Uh, so, uh, so that was kind of fun. Um, and uh, last but not least, I'm going to wrap things up by saying um, Abilene has impressed me to the, uh, the extent right now that if you walk out to my car on the back, you'll see an I Like Ike license plate. So, uh, you know, I can't live here. Um, I have a house in, in Salina, but, you know, this is, I feel like I'm a resident. And I appreciate the support I've gotten from uh, everyone in Abilene and uh, the rest of Dickinson County. And uh, if there's any way I can, uh, you know, make life better, let me know. And, and my, my pledge to you is if you, uh, people write me postcards, I send them a postcard back. Uh, any, anyone that comes to visit me, I'll write them a thank you note. Uh, I feel like when people come to visit me in Topeka and they spend their time and energy and money to get there, then I feel like I owe them my presence. So I have, you know, I have a lot of territory uh, to cover and, and there, anytime somebody comes to visit their representative, they also want to see their senator, well, it kind of makes sense. Well, it's a challenge, but uh, we get it done. And I uh, appreciate every time somebody walks in the door to say hello or to uh, talk about an issue. So. Uh, any, anything I can do to, to make uh, Abilene a better place to live, uh, just pass the ideas along and we'll see if we can make that happen. So thank you. Uh, good morning. And I was shocked this morning when I got up to it. Also, I thought we didn't hail outside. I was down in a bar the other day and the ground was white. We had hail. Then yesterday was over in Chapman. So I just snapped and thought, well, we had a hemp last night. Then I realized I could see the snowflakes coming down. So it's not the first time it's snowed this late in the year. I, when the grass is green, we get a little snow. But uh, uh, I want to thank Senator Hardy. Uh, I'll echo many of his comments, although I don't do that 100-year-old thing. <laughs> uh, Rick Welburn, our other senator, 
is in another forum in McPherson today. It's the reason he's not here. And I meant to be happy to have to tell the group that uh, he's sorry, but he had like five counties. So he, he, he's got a larger area than either one of us. But he would have liked to have been here. Uh, for who, those who don't know me, and I think most of I think I recognize everybody here. I'm John Barger. I'm state representative for the 70s. Uh, I'm on my fourth term. And uh, I chair the uh, Federal and State Affairs Committee in the House, which is one of the exempt committees. We have three exempt committees, appropriations, tax, and federal and state affairs. And so it means we can work bills until the very last day. So I've been pretty busy this year. Uh, I think we've had about 38 bills in my committee. Now, we've not heard all those bills, but we've heard a number of them uh, for our post audit. Uh, I, it rotates between a House and a Senate, so this year I've chaired it, I've chaired it uh, well, the last few times that a House member has chaired it, I've chaired it, I think, three times. Um, but it's been an interesting year uh, because we have a new administration. Uh, and some believe that she didn't think she was going to get elected governor, Governor Kelly, because uh, when other governors have come in, they've already had their secretaries picked out, they've done all the background checks and everything. Uh, this administration was not prepared for that. So they uh, appointed temporary uh, uh, secretaries until they could get the background tech checks. And then they, when they actually nominate someone, then they go to the Senate for confirmation. The Senate's been doing that. Uh, well, last week you did see several of them, I believe the Senate uh, approved several of those. So things are a little slow. We've had less bills introduced this year than we have in past years because those secretaries permanent secretaries that have been approved, you know, usually have an agenda, uh, things that they want for their department. And because we didn't have uh, a full-time secretary, those bills didn't come to us. I would, I would suspect that next year, we're going to have quite a few bills introduced at the beginning of the session. Uh, I, I've worked with uh, children and families and a number of other secretaries that have come in, but most of them just are temporary. They don't know if they're going to get a permanent appointment or not. So that, that's a little different this year. Um, in the House, I think there's about 380 bills that have been introduced. Of course, we always get a lot of them. Sometimes it's as many as 900 to 1,000, but well, we haven't had that many this year. The things that I've concentrated on uh, is uh, things that are, are relevant to my committee. Of course, the Federal State Affairs Committee that has public policy. We, we established the public policy. So we have everything from gaming, we have uh, anything with uh, uh, right to life, we have everything that involves alcohol, and then any, any other uh, resolutions that may come through or constitutional amendments. So that's, that, I have a 23 member committee, uh, and, uh, and we work well together. For those, uh, we are talking about keeping the communities updated, I hope with the, comp with the help of equal communication, I think it's every Saturday night and Sunday night. I do a show on Friday as I come back from Topeka uh, to give a legislative update. It's a 30 minute show. Uh, and I, you normally have guests on it. I've had the Speaker of the House, I've had the Majority Leader a number of times. Last week I had the Minority Leader, the Democrat, uh, who's the Minority Leader in the House, come on. Uh, I felt it was a pretty good show. Uh, in May 10th, I think I have the Attorney General coming on. But it's one way to keep updated. If you don't get Eagle, if you live outside the, the, in the county, you can go to my Facebook, and I have a regular uh, political Facebook that you can watch those shows on my Facebook, and you can get updated. And I usually come in and talk about what happened that week, what bills we worked, what bills uh, were passed, what bills were rejected. Uh, and we have, uh, you know, I, I talk with, uh, the superintendent of uh, Havley Schools a couple of days ago, Chris Cooper, the assistant superintendent, I should say. And uh, I talked with the county commissioners on Thursday to keep them updated on what's going on. Uh, Chris, uh, Mr. Cooper, you know, he's been around long enough that he understands that whatever we've done to this far, as far as education or anything, is just that. We've got this far. The last two weeks, well, we're going back next week for conference committees. Conference committees are where bills have passed the House, went to the Senate, they may have amended it, the 
comes back to, this, to the House, we non concur, then we put them in conference committees. Uh, the same with the Senate, they sent them to us. Uh, I had, I think I worked uh, five or six Senate bills last week. All of them were amended because the House needs to put its fingerprints on it. And it goes back to the Senate. My counterpart, Senator Estes, who's chairman of the Senate uh, Fed State, not concurred, we'll get into conference next week and we'll work out the differences. And then we'll put bills together and then we'll run them in a conference committee report. Uh, the reason we run them in a conference committee report is they're not germane or they're not amendable. Uh, they, it's an up or down vote. And that's just a procedural that we always use. Uh, but overall, uh, it's, it's been a very relaxed year uh, from years past. Uh, I was telling somebody, I think it was, uh, uh, well, I guess it was Chris Cooper, the county commissioner. I'd come out of the story, I shouldn't say this. But I, my, my, my office is on the second floor, the governor's office is on the second floor. And I've known the governor for six years. She served on my post audit committee. And we get along. Uh, she's a very nice lady, very smart lady. Uh, we differ politically, but uh, so I came out of the, the man's bathroom uh, and I had washed my hands. And I came out and she said, John, come here, I don't talk to you. So I'm wiping my hand on my coat just to make sure it's dry, right? And I went over and shook hands with her. And she wanted to talk about a sports book. Uh, this is a Supreme Court of the United States uh, last June, I think, entered a decision uh, based on a lawsuit from the state of New Jersey. Had filed suit because, uh, as far as gaming, the only state that was allowed to have a sports book, which is the betting on professional ball, ball games or the Right now, the tournament, the big dance, uh, we're not allowed to have that. The Supreme Court decided, no, you can't just have one state have it. So they opened it up to all states. So a number of states have already passed it. West Virginia, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Delaware, Pennsylvania, and several other states. Missouri's got a bill now. So she wanted to talk about that. So we talked about that in the hallway. Uh, and we're working on that. And that's one of my areas that I, that Response, I'm responsible for, so I'm working with my senator counterpart. We have passed a budget, uh, the House version, Senate has passed their version. Uh, education, the Senate has passed the governor's version. The House has passed a policy version of that. So next week we will again go to conference. Uh, and we will negotiate, the House will negotiate with the Senate to come out with a product that they, we believe that will pass both bodies, and that's what it's got to do. And keep in mind, the governor has a veto, and so we have to have someone from her office, her liaison officer there, to see. And sometimes we do things, and, and even though the liaison tells us she may veto, uh, sometimes they don't know until the actual, they get the bill. I know recently she vetoed Senate Bill 22. This was a, a, a tax bill. Uh, Last year, year before uh, 17, the federal government passed a, a tax bill. And you may recall where it gives, uh, it raises the individual deductions up, and it did some things to bring some foreign money of uh, uh, American corporations back home, because before they were taxed at a higher level. So if they owned a company, for example, in France, and it had a, a large profit, there was a great, uh, a pretty sizable penalty to bring that money back. Uh, the Congress and President Trump wanted to be able to bring that money back and invest it here. So they reduced it at one time to bring that money back. And we are what's called a rolling conformity state, which means whatever the federal government does, we automatically can just do that unless we go back in with legislation. Because they raised the deductions up, average Kansans could not take the de individual deductions. So we wanted to do that because if we, we did not do that, the state would get $132 million more than it would have the year before. So we uh, passed that, I'm on tax, uh, we passed it out of tax, we married it up with two other bills, one being the internet tax. Uh, we collect about 90% of all the internet tax purchases made over the internet. But there's about 10, some, the Department of Revenue says 
uh, my post-audit committee, which I had them do an audit last year, says 10%, but it's about 40 to $70 million. You are required, if you buy stuff over the internet and if you've not paid sales taxes, on your tax form, there's a, a bought the check, and you're supposed to remit that to the state voluntarily. It doesn't really work. Uh, <laughs> so you all may be in violation of the tax of the tax of the tax rule. So we all what's that? We all not you all. No, yeah. <laughs> I don't buy anything over. Okay. Now I do call my daughter and say I'd like to have this because she has one of those great Amazon account golds or something, so she gets it delivered to my house. Uh, but uh, so it, technically she bought it in Texas. But anyways, uh, so we 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 close that loophole, and then using that money that would be coming in the forty to seventy million dollars, we were able to give a one cent reduction in sales taxes because that's going to be about sixty million dollars. So we were hopeful to do that. So we we put them all in one package, both houses. Uh, I think the Senate passed a large majority. Uh, the House did too, and we sent it to the governor, and we were hopeful that she would uh, would sign it. Uh, unfortunately, she chose not to, and she had a reason. Uh, she wanted to wait until April 15th when we get the consensus revenues in to see where we're, we're at. Uh, I disagree with that, but but I understand. It, it, it's, you know, it's a reason. So we, we hopefully, uh, now that the veto, the Senate's got to look at it first, because it was a Senate bill, that whether they choose to override or veto or not. And I try not to get into the Senate because what bothers me about senators, we all have to go up front and actually speak in front of our body. They all get their own microphone. So they can <laughs> so, so, uh, so they, they, they talk a little longer than the rest of us. When you have to actually get out of your chair and walk up the front and face 125 people. Uh, but we did do that. We passed a, uh, an education bill. And I guess we'll all take questions on that a little later. But our budget bill that we uh, was talking about, I think it's like $17 billion all funds, a little over $7 billion in state uh, general funds. Uh, and uh, so hopefully, and, and the outgears hopefully look a little better. But uh, we, you know, 60, 60, 62 percent of our entire budget goes to education, K through 12 and higher ed. It's about 55%, I think, of K through K through 12. There was one thing I was going to talk about. I didn't know if I brought it. It's it's debt. May have some questions. <clears throat> Dixon County is 80 million dollars in debt, whether you know that or not. Uh, but compared to Johnson County, we're doing pretty good. Uh, about 43 million of that is in school debt, and the rest is just in bonds and different. But I have a sheet here. I think I'm going to put this on my. Facebook account let you look at that. You can, well, I don't know if I can, I think I can do both sides of it. Uh, I'm not the most uh, technology proficient person in the world. But I'll take questions on any other issues, but I'm gonna thank you for coming out today on this beautiful Kansas day. And uh, I will sit down and make, at this point, I think we take questions. I was just gonna throw out one right. thing though. Uh, Representative Barton was talking about all this concur, non concur stuff. And, it, you know, every now and then, this happened last week, the Senate actually concurred with the House proposal. Well, just to, just to make it correct, uh, 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 I want to correct it. Well, it is correct. <laughs> <laughs> I made the first concur on a Senate bill. Oh! Uh, House bill that the Senate had amendments to. It was non controversial because I concurred, uh, it was on a bill that. April 1, uh, convenience stores will now be able to sell 6% beer. Mm -hmm. uh, and we passed this bill in 17. Mm -hmm. This is what's called a trailer bill. It came through my committee uh, because we needed to do a few corrections, uh, and, and, and particularly about the tax, the different taxes because you have an alcohol tax and then you have a regular food tax. And so we did that and it went to the Senate. And of course, the Senate, in its wisdom, made clarifying language, which means they were clarifying what we said. I thought it was pretty clear, but, but uh, they did add clarifying language. And it, so it came back to the House. And because of the time, uh, 1 April, become effective, I wanted to get it to the governor. 
if the Senate had not just sat on it for two, three weeks, we'd have got there before. But uh, as you can see, we have some rivalry here <laughs> between the House and the Senate. Uh, but it is passed. It's to the governor. And hopefully she'll get it signed pretty quickly and uh, because uh, we, we really needed that to, to ensure that the, uh, the, the same regulation that deals with liquor stores deals with those convenience stores that are selling the 6% beer. But I did concur on your Senate amendments of clarifying language. Thank you. Can you tell me where we are with the Rural Opportunity Zone? We are. We're Thanks to our Senate. Okay, yeah. We, uh, uh, we just uh, passed the, the bill that uh, included uh, uh, Dickinson County as a, a new addition as a rural opportunity zone. Technically speaking, Dickinson County does not qualify, but early in the session, um, there was a kind of the, the freshman uh, senator was going around, he was wanting to add Crawford County, and he was looking for help. And so uh, he said, I, I, I want to get Crawford County as a rural opportunity zone. Will you co-sponsor? I said, if you put Dickinson in, I will. <laughs> and so, uh, and so uh, I think it, it's a great opportunity for Dickinson County. It, it is. It provides uh, student loans yeah. up to $15,000. And also uh, state abatement. It's a tax. It has that in there. Five years uh, ago. I like the educational. As long as they come back mm -hmm. to, to, to a rural area after college, yeah, thanks, John. Well, the reason I ask is we have a doctor who wants to come back here, but mm -hmm. she's at Indi she's in Indiana doing a residency, and so this would help us greatly to bring her back. Yeah, it would, and, I, and I, I, I think the House will pass it when it comes over, and we'll yeah. put it in the conference committee. And I believe the governor would, yeah, I don't know what the governor is. Is there any reason it. why you think it wouldn't pass, or is there? Uh, well, I think because if you look at your criteria, <laughs> We're on the, I won't say we don't qualify, I think we do qualify. It's how you interpret the existing <laughs> law. Uh, but I think we do qualify, and uh, if you know, that objection is raised on the floor of the House, I'll, I'll go up and defend it. Because uh, the it, 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 statute, existing statute, it controls that in vain. Yeah. And so I think you can argue either way. There are, you see, the, the thing is, there are 77 counties that already qualify. Right. And so the list, this would make the list six counties more. And so pretty soon, I, I was talking to some Johnson County, well, why can't we put Johnson County in there? And then, you know, I, or let's make the whole state a rural opportunity. So well, I don't think it, it was designed that way, but I think, you know, Dickinson County is a wet, more of a Western County, more rural uh, in nature and smaller. Yeah. And, and I think with those, those criteria, then um, that, that was the way I was interpreting it to me. And because, you know, I, I didn't even try Saline County because I, I knew that that one wouldn't fly and I didn't want to, uh, you know, kill the bill by, by saying you have to have that so one in there. Johnson County representatives think anything west of Topeka is rural. Yeah. Uh, I think some of them are Topeka, but it's, it's uh, I think it's got a very good chance, and hopefully it will pass. And that would be helpful for your career doctor. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. What's, what's the status of the Farm Bureau's non-health insurance, health insurance? <laughs> the Senate passed it. Easily. It, it easily. Uh, <laughs> and, and, you know, I, I'm not in love with this bill, I will tell you, because it's not insurance. No. Oh, yeah. And, and I, I've already told them that I would vote against it because the one, they're picking out the, the, the young, healthy folks, taking them out. But also, you know, I had several calls from some farmers that are members of the Farm Bureau saying that I should support this, but it's not insurance. Mm -hmm. so if you have a claim <laughs> and they refuse to pay you, you can't go to the insurance commissioner and have a hearing. You have to go down here to the district court and hire an attorney, which costs you three or four thousand dollars, file a suit in, in uh, in the district court and litigate that, which could cost you another $10,000 to get them to pay a claim. Uh, and, and Kansas Farm Bureau is not Kansas Farm Bureau anymore. It's owned by a company in Iowa. Uh, so, I, you know, when they get to pick who they want to serve, and there is no uh, guardian, so to speak, like we have with the insurance commissioner that can say you can go to the insurance commissioner, it doesn't cost you anything, make a complaint. They have hearing officers and will make the determination and force the insurance companies to pay the claim. 
if that association group that does not insurance, you don't have any of those avenues. Well, is that kind of precedent for other entities to do yeah. that? There's a, uh, there's a group that's similar in, in nature. It's called MediShare. I don't know if you've heard about commercials for it or not, but it's, 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 a, it's a health plan. It's not insurance, as uh, uh, Representative Parker said. But uh, the thing that convinced me on, on this particular bill was the farm families that were coming in, and most of them are independent contractors. You know, they don't, they don't belong to farmers groups, um, except for Kansas Farm Bureau. And uh, the reason they needed that is they, they said, you know, we're paying $30,000 between premiums and our deduct deductible. And we can't deal with that anymore. And so this particular bill uh, would give them an opportunity to uh, purchase insurance, not insurance, a health plan um, at a more reasonable rate, 30 to 40 percent less than what a typical insurance plan would, would charge them. There was no, no coverage for pre-existing conditions, uh, which was that, that's the that's a bulk of the uh, the additional cost, uh, but it would give them something. They, uh, in my mind, it was providing another choice. I'm big for consumers. You know, consumers have more choices. I'm happy. So uh, that was that was the reason I, I supported the bill in the Senate, and I think it's uh, you know you don't have to buy it. Uh, you can just go for the go the traditional route if you want, and, or you can go some other route. But I, I felt like we needed to have that as an option for people so, so that they felt like they weren't just out there uh, naked, uh, no insurance, no, no help. And, uh, and that, that's the part that uh, I was most, most concerned about. And, and my response to that would be is they're picking and choosing, which would cause other folks' insurance to go up. If they take all the healthy and not cover pre-existing conditions, then they're getting the, the cream off the top. And which would cause other, you know, based upon the actuarials and stuff, that you know, it's kind of a balance, uh, and you're taking that balance uh, out. And if you have a claim, if they don't want to pay, if they pay it fine, if they don't, then you have to end up in district court. You can't go to the insurance commissioner. And that's my big objection. Well, this is the kind of discussion goes on in the all the time. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and it's always a yeah, we, we have our congressman here. <laughs> But, yeah. Any other questions out here? Uh, or did you all come? Probably not for us to see our Congress. Steve? Yeah, I'd just like to make a comment. I have the opportunity to work in Topeka most days, and I want you all to know how hard these guys work. You would not believe how hard they work. I mean, they're, they're at it early in the morning to late at night every day, and uh, they've always had time to visit with me on issues that I've wanted to work on. And uh, I just, I think we ought to give them a round of applause for the fine work that they've been doing for us. We're, we're both the same age, so we're kind of institutionalized. We're not working on a young age. We don't know how not to. I'm in my office at 7 o'clock in the morning. Of course, the Senate comes in late, but they stay late. <laughs> we, last week we stayed, uh, I think, uh, Tuesday night, we worked 37 bills on the floor of the house. We started at 8.30 in the morning. We got out at 10.30 at night. I got back to my room about midnight after I did my paperwork out, which does several for my bills. And then uh, on Wednesday, we went in early and had calendar at night. Went on the floor at 10, and we stayed till 9.30 that night. Uh, so it, 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 the last few days of any session before drop, that, drop dead day, is next week. Uh, you know, we've got to get these bills out because all the committees have done all the work and they've had the hearings and stuff, but they send them out. I think you mentioned the uh, Senate Judiciary had handed out how many dead bills the last day? Uh, 11. 11 bills. I know I passed out four, but, but I had worked on four. Uh, so the last few days, and then May 1, we're, we're here next week. We go back next week uh, till Friday, hopefully Thursday, because uh, that way we can save a day. Because we're at Wednesday, it was day 68 out of 90. So we're going to do next week and then come back on 1 May. Uh, and I think we're scheduled for 15 days. And that's the veto session, uh, which is really not a veto session anymore. That's actually when we'll do education because we're negotiating now with the Senate. The Senate's negotiating with us. So I was 
anything that has been passed as far as budgets and education and, and, and health care and stuff will probably not be decided until the recount session. Uh, because that's, you know, I, I hate to say this, but the legislature works best on a time restraint. But they say, you know, we got three days left, then we actually start negotiating seriously. So, but, uh, but thank you, Steve. I, I, we've worked several bills together. I know uh, the, con the senator has uh, get ready to call you congressman. But uh, I've sure. uh, <laughs> worked, uh, worked well. And, and Steve's a real asset to us up there. And he works with uh, disabilities. And uh, he, uh, he has a vast knowledge. And we've worked on the uh, assisted decision making uh, bill and several others he introduced. And uh, it's uh, always been a pleasure when you come to the office. Uh, Harold, do you have any questions? Harold? Well, I just wanted to know if there's any progress on osteotomy and mental health. Uh, in the state. Do you know where we are with that? Mm -hmm. this okay. You want to go? Go ahead. Uh, you know, osteotomy. <laughs> it was a mess four years ago when we lost our federal funding. Or I think it was six years ago now. But uh, we put additional money in our budget for it. Uh, but it's such an old structure. You know, it was almost, if you look at it, you know, legislators never look long term. We actually need to build or acquire uh, another hospital that is more modern. Is there any consensus on that yet, or are we still? We can't agree on prisons either. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but I'll tell you, if, if we were smart, and, 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 and usually what we try to do is, and I, and I made this suggestion to the speaker, uh, is that we all sometimes need commissions like they do with the BRAC commission with the military. They make the decision and we just have an up or down vote because we can get more in some ways uh, like prisons or hospitals and stuff that done that way. Uh, but, uh, but I know we put more money in it, but it's such an old structure that, you know, and, and the federal, since we lost our federal certification and we got it back, they're coming down regularly check it as they should. The reason I ask is we end up in a bad position with patients that we can't move anywhere. Mm -hmm. but at, and you know that already, but I... Yeah, I mean, I, you know, when I used to do child need, uh, not child care, uh, uh, mental illness cases, you know, we could, at one point in time, could send us to line a hospital and keep the 48 hours because of Central Kansas Mental Health is the gatekeeper. And then they would come back to court and we could send them to Larder or, or also Watami and, you know, we did modernize some where we could do it by FaceTime and doing those hearings because we were sending deputies down to pick them up for a, a 20 minute hearing in court. But, uh, but I think the you know, long term solution is that uh, it's just an old structure yeah. and trying to, trying to, and getting staff. I mean, Larned has the same problem. A lot of professionals don't want to live in Larned, Kansas. And, you know, when you're talking about, uh, yeah, I'm going to switch subjects to uh, APRNs. I was a, uh, uh, advanced nurse practitioners. We had a bill because um, presently they have to have a collaborative agreement with a medical doctor, but they can set up clinics. And uh, one good example was a psychiatric uh, APRN out in Western Kansas. She had a psychiatrist. She had a collaborative agreement. She had three clinics so the mental health issues of those counties. But he was like 76, 77, and he was going to retire. And as soon as he retired, she lost her collaborative agreement. She couldn't continue serving her patients. Uh, and there was no other psychiatrist who was going to come to that area. So they were going to lose that. So we worked on a bill, hopefully, that uh, uh, we will get to at some point in time that allows some of them to work independently. Uh, you know, I. I when I talked to Harold, you know, uh, I know he uh, has the APR heads going out to Solomon, Solomon Corp and stuff like that. Right. You're, you're working on a few other things, on a few other businesses and stuff. But it's one of those things that, uh, you know, getting telemedicine we passed a couple of years ago is helpful. We need to expand that. Because if you're out in northern Kansas and you don't have to see your cardiologist, you're either going to come to Salina or you're going to go to Topeka or maybe Kansas City. Whereas you can go to your local doctor, they can get your cardiologist on the screen 
they can tell them what to look for. And I'm not trying to, I have no medical knowledge whatsoever. But they, 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 with your doctor or an APRN, they can do those checks and stuff. And it would save you, save you the trip to Kansas City or Topeka or so on. Yeah, could I just add one thing? Please. I think that if you are going to pass that type of legislation, I think there's still a lot of debate about whether they should practice independent or not because the real the, the realism is they're not physicians. The other is I think that new people coming out of school don't belong without oversight. And I agree. I would just say that people in our yeah. health system will always have I, oversight. I think we have 44,000 hours. I know Colorado only has 1,000 hours. Several other states have other yeah. numbers. Uh, so, but, you, but you're correct, we, we want at least 4,000 hours. And I'd like to reiterate what Steve's, I, you know, you guys are always available to us, you always talk to us. John comes out and spends a Friday now and then with me, and I think it's very well, important. So coffee. thank you very much to both of you. I would like to come out to you about the coffee. That's what I told Chris Cooper the day when I was meeting with the school superintendent or system. I said, do you have coffee? Yeah. If you're going to have me come out at 8 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> uh, and I was shocked today. We had no donuts. Legislators live on coffee and donuts. Sure. In the I did get a brownie, but, but, but for the next one, folks, uh, you know, glazed donuts, glazed donuts is good. I mean, remember, I started out in law enforcement 45 years ago. I didn't even know it. I went to the legislature. I was quite happy to see that we had donuts every morning before calendar or coffee. Can I ask a question concerning mental health? Yes. Um, I can't tell you where the grant is from, but, but the school district, Dickinson County is part of a pilot program yes. to provide mental health to rural facilities. And I know they told me yesterday they have 125 25. kids getting uh, um, therapy. Yes. And, uh, and so what is the status of that being a, a second year program? Okay, uh, this bill came out last year. It was uh, brought up by uh, Representative Landwehr out of Wichita. She's very big in mental health. I'm the one that got her to add Dickinson County, our school districts in Dickinson County, because I thought we would be a good model because we have Central Kansas mental health. And uh, in fact, the day it was supposed to have worked on the floor, I got a call from my superintendent. Now, you may have been in that meeting when Denise called me and said, John, uh, we got a problem. The physical agent was going to be a Saline County uh, co op. And uh, I said, well, you know, we're supposed to be debating the bill today. I said, well, let me see what I can do, because they didn't want to do it to Saline County Co-op. Uh, Abilene District said we would do it. And so I went back and I talked to Brenda, and I got her to continue the, uh, the, the bill for not, to not debate it that day and give me a day or two to grow up an amendment. Moving it, and then I got a lot of flack from my Saline County representative, who were, were not as well informed, because they were complaining that we were taking away from Saline County. Well, I said, call this folks. They don't want to do this. They're not making any money out of it. And uh, so we were able to change it to 435. I do know we've got 125 students that are enrolled in it. It will continue to be good funded, uh, at least for the next two more years, I think. Uh, but I did find out we had 125. Now that's in Abilene. I don't know what's. Uh, We're at 18 right now. You're at 18? Yeah. And, and, and uh, uh, well, Harrington too. Harrington. Somebody mentioned Harrington. Uh, right. That they probably have a pretty good number too. Right. And I think Chad is full time. I can't give you the number of Chad, but I think they, they've got a good number. But it was a good deal for Dickens County when I was able to get all the, because I, I, I didn't want one district to compete against another district. So when I went back with the proposal to Brenda, I said, I want all the school districts in Dickens County covered. And she was, you know, after a little conversation and a little negotiation, uh, she had a bill that she wanted me to work in my committee. We worked it out, so it was fine, but we got them in there. It was a last minute deal, though, because Denise called me. I was on the floor of the house. We were debating bills, and it was like three down. And uh, she had all the superintendents there. And I said, if that's what you guys want, then that's what we'll do. So fortunately, we were able to do that. But I was shocked when Chris told me had 125. I was a little surprised. Do you think two more years? Yeah. Uh, I was just surprised. I thought it would be 25, 50. You know, you never know. But uh, <clears throat> but they also, and I, I, we got a superintendent here from Zongo. Uh, I was concerned that Central Kansas Mental Health did not have the staff to do this. 
but apparently that's not been a problem. Maybe you can speak to that. Uh, they're, they're always looking for uh, help, of course, but uh, I think one of the great things is that uh, it's been a great partnership because uh, there's not lost time of travel or right. line or wherever you're going to receive the services. It's in there in the school and it works out for a yeah, I think it goes back to the other parts we talked about mental health. Uh, hospitals as well, Osbottomy and Larn and some of those things, I think it does trickle down in the schools, which is we're seeing more needs and different needs than we've ever seen before in school districts. Yeah. Well, I've had conversations with Denise before session started that year, and we'd had this conversation, and I was trying to figure out how to work it, and Denise mm -hmm. brought it to my attention and said, well, if you just give it to the money to the mental health people, we may not get the services because they may want to use it in other areas. So she was very adamant about it getting it to the school districts and then letting them work, they would have the pot of money and let them, and that way they knew that they would, that Central Kansas would provide those services. And so that's the way we postured it. Uh, so that the school district got the money, they could buy the services instead of giving the money to the mental health. So initially that was what they were proposing. They were just give them, and then they would provide services as, as they deemed appropriate. So I think it's worked out. Uh, I'm glad uh, when I talked to Chris and uh, talked to our older superintendents, and they were pretty positive. I didn't, didn't know what your numbers were. Uh, Other questions? Senator Marshall's chomping at the bit. He just flew in from yeah. D.C. probably. Very easy question. Uh, what is the overall working atmosphere with the new governor? Uh, I tell you what, this is kind of interesting. Um, I was uh, working over noon one day, and uh, I, rare for me to be there over noon. Uh, usually, there's two or three lunches going on uh, in, the, in the area, and so I. And then my phone rang, and I was happened to be in my office assistant's area, so I just picked up the phone, and in popped uh, Governor Kelly and, and her aide, and I said, "Can I call you back?" And she said. Uh, can, I chat? can I chat? And uh, I said, oh, definitely. And so at the first time a governor walked into my office to chat, uh, usually it's the other way around, and rarely would I get an audience. <laughs> uh, a couple times I, I, I saw Governor Brown back out on the, in the rotunda and would, would chat with him something. Uh, so I, I was, I've been impressed, but you know, she was a senator, and uh, she's, she is really, um, comfortable in our corridor uh, there and so in, in a way that uh, didn't surprise me but she's using some some senators as a sounding board uh, for legislation and uh, we get along fine uh, you know, we don't agree necessarily on everything either but uh, she she wants to have a conversation and I have a feeling we'll finish on time I, I don't see any reason not to um, frankly I mean we, we've got we only have a couple really major things to do education budget and and then, you know, the rest of the stuff, uh, if we could... <laughs> he said that too. No, I'm so <laughs> uh, But I, I'm confident. I'm optimistic anyway. Oh, I think uh, Governor Kelly and I, you know, served together six years on post audit. So we've had year-round post audit actually means we're year-round. Uh, she doesn't like Chick-fil-A. You know, because that. You know, when I was chairman, I, I happen to love Chick-fil-A. And so I would always order lunches for our committee members. And she'd come up to John, you know, I don't eat Chick-fil-A. I was jokingly told her, I said, yes, uh, at that time, Senator. I said, Senator, you run back to your office and close the doors, put down the drapes, and then you eat Chick-fil-A. She said, no, she really, so we have a, a good relationship. Uh, and we've debated issues in the committee many times. I have a lot of respect for her. Uh, I don't agree with her on many things. But uh, last week I had the minority leader, uh, Tom Sawyer. Uh, he's the minority leader in the House. He runs the Democrats. I had him on my show, Eagle Communication. Hope you get to see that uh, on Saturday and Sunday nights. But Tom and I are good friends. He's an accountant. We've been friends. He, uh, he uh, has served as my vice chair when I was chairman of uh, the rules and the journal, uh, which means we had to make some tough decisions two of us together. Uh, we go out to dinner on occasion. Uh, I've just got a lot of respect for him. He served on my, on my uh, last two years, not this year, two years prior. 
he served on my federal state affairs, and he was a valued member. And he told me once, I think this was on the show, he said, the only reason I served on that committee was because you were the chairman. Because uh, I knew you'd be fair to everybody. And I said, well, thank you for that. That was probably the best compliment I've had to the legislature. Tom's a good guy. Uh, but we debated on the show, we debated some educational uh, positions. The House has a, uh, a position, the Senate has a position. Uh, I think the School Board Association prefers the Senate bill. The House did not pass the money part of it. We passed some policies because the Supreme Court decided uh, when its decision last time, Gannon, four or five, whatever, Six. it's been going on for 40 years, lawsuits, is that they wanted to address the lower 25, the 25% that's not doing well. So we put things in there. And, and I, I, I know the uh, superintendent to my right, we never refer to people's names in the legislature, so I always say my superintendent to my right here. Uh, you know, he thinks we're trying to manage uh, their job. And at some points, I, I would agree, some of it goes too far. But we, we actually want results, because that's what the Supreme Court told us we needed to do, is to help the 25% that is not performing. And, and we tried to do that. Uh, but when you get you know, a number of people involved properly, we did some of it, but not everything. And we probably did it. We went over for a few areas. But uh, hopefully, we get to conference. We'll come up with a product that both the Senate and the House can approve on. And, and, uh, and the governor will be involved. And hopefully, uh, I think we're going to take the governor's money. That's just my perspective. But we'll add our policy. I said that would probably be a, a compromise that would work. And uh, with that, I, uh, I know the congressman is just waiting to get up here. You guys are doing good. Yeah, you got it. You're doing fine. <laughs> uh, any other questions before the senator and I leave? Thanks for coming out again. Uh, And don't forget about my newsletter over there if you're interested. Give me your name and email address and I'll get you added. And, and if you want to sign up to my Facebook, it's John Barker on Facebook. Every week, the show that we tape on Friday, 30-minute show, is posted. It's not only on, uh, I think it's on your website, too. It goes on the Eagles website. It goes on the uh, channel, too, uh, Saturdays and Sundays. It's at 30, 11 o'clock, something like that. Uh, I would encourage you to watch it. If you don't want to watch it, uh, or if you can't get Eagle, go to my Facebook. It's posted every week, and you get to see some of the other people that are involved, like the majority leader, uh, minority leader's been on, uh, speaker's been on, the speaker pro tem's been on. I just try to break different guests and have a different perspective and from a different area. So uh, you may want to watch that. If not, that's okay too. Let me get off here. Well, thank you, Representative Barker and uh, Senator Hardy. We appreciate you guys coming out today. Yeah. And uh, before I introduce our esteemed congressman, I'd also like to mention that we have the district representative for uh, U.S. Senator Jerry Moran's office, Kristen Little, here with us in the audience. Okay. She's really great about coming out and supporting our events. Of course, we've got, we have that congressman, Dr. Roger Marshall. Thank you. We're setting the stage. You're setting the stage, okay. Uh, thank you. You ready for me? Anytime. Okay, you're sure? Okay, thank you. All right, thanks for having me. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, glad to be here again. Appreciate the invitation. Appreciate uh, just the time to be here. Thought I might just start maybe by, by uh, sharing a, a little story. Two weeks ago, I was invited to the White House by President Trump, and he, he asked me to come there to talk about health care. And I was told by his chief of staff, Mick Mulvaney, who's quite a character, we were on the baseball team together, and I got to know Mick a little bit better, uh, and he's, he's just, he just loves his job, which is really interesting working for the president. But anyway, I was told by Mick I'd have 10 minutes to talk about health care. So we, we got to the White House, we went into the Oval Office, and I sat down beside the President. And the first thing he said is he turned and looked at me and he said, Roger, how are your farmers doing? And I said, well, Mr. President, actually, it's not well. It's not going good in agriculture land. It's pretty tough times. 
And for the next 20 minutes, we talked about agriculture. And I want you to know the president knows the struggle that agriculture is going through right now. He knows that the agriculture is born the tip of the spear when it comes to retaliation of these tariffs. And he has great compassion for agriculture. He knows that they are his biggest supporters. And he said, go back to Kansas, tell your farmers thank you. Thank you for continuing to, so, to support him. And it's interesting as I go through the state, and I think we've done 130 town halls, maybe three or 400 round tables since we became elected. And everywhere I go, the farmers know that there's long-term opportunity here, that this short-term pain is worth the long-term gain. Most every farmer has a story about China and how they were done wrong by them in some type of a deal, and they still are supporting the president. We talked in great detail about the China trade deal. Um, he said, hang in there, go back and tell your farmers, hang in there with me. In the next several weeks, we hope to have a major announcement on China. And I know next week the premier, the vice premier from China will be in D.C. again, and I think we're getting very closely very close to that agreement. And then he turned to me and he, he talked to me, he said, well, what about USMCA? So USMCA is the Trump NAFTA reading deal, right? He turned to me and he said, uh, Congressman, can we get this deal through Congress? So he's done all the heavy lifting, now it's up to Congress to approve it. And I said, Mr. President, we don't have a choice. We have to get USMCA approved. My farmers, my city, my states, we desperately need it. We export four times more to, to uh, Mexico and Canada than we do to China. China, a huge upside, but right now those farmers need that certainty. So I just want you to know that the, the President of the United States gets it. He absolutely does get it. You know, a couple other things I might share from that, from that visit as well. Number one is right next to the Oval Office, he has his own little private office. And in that room, he has a list up on the wall of his campaign promises. Some got check marks by him and some don't. But when was the last politician you know that has a list of their campaign promises and he's committed to getting those done? I'm standing beside the president supporting him on those campaign promises. And I guess the last story I would tell you is kind of a more uh, humorous story is we were sitting literally closer than we're sitting here beside each other. There's a little coffee table between us. Little box with a red button on it. <laughs> And you can't help but, as you talk to the president, kind of glance at the little red button. And we're pretty far into the conversation. We actually stayed for an hour and a half. My 10 minutes turned into an hour and a half. And he, he caught me looking at the red button and he said, I bet you're kind of worried about that, aren't you? I said, well, Mr. President, and he reached over and he pressed the button. And I looked outside, I thought the helicopter might be flying in to get him and me. I thought he'd let me on the helicopter with him and maybe missiles would be going off. But I looked up in about 10 seconds, there was a, 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 a sergeant in Marine Corps that was there with a Diet Coke for him. <laughs> the president lives on Diet Coke and um, I hope he's eating cheeseburgers rather than chicken. We grow a lot more beefier than we do chicken. So anyway, um, I've never seen the president so enthused. I don't know how he keeps doing it. He's bore the weight of the world on his shoulders. He's been picked at, been accused of treason, and he's standing tall. And obviously a great week for us this week um, that he was exonerated from, from all, the, all those issues as well. So a great week in, in Congress. I gave a speech on the House floor Monday morning after the Mueller exoneration. Not a Democrat in the House. On the entire House floor, morning debate, I've never seen it so quiet. The halls of Congress were quiet. Not one Democrat showed up for morning debate and was very proud uh, to have stood beside the president since day one. Um, I'm pretty sure I'm the first congressman to have called this a witch hunt. Um, I thought it was a witch hunt from the beginning, and I think that this Mueller report has confirmed that. What else do we want to talk about? Everywhere I go, the top two issues people talk to me about uh, our number one is a lack of people for the jobs we have. It's not just in southwest Kansas, now it's the entire state, it's the entire country. The other issue I hear a lot about is the cost of health care. The cost of health care uh, as well. You know, on the, on the job sites, I think I'm supposed to be uh, a leader and share well, what's my vision for Kansas look like and talk about solutions, talk about goals, objectives, and solutions. When it comes to a lack of people for the jobs we have, 
I think there's something that I can do, and there's something that we can do collectively. You know, number one is we need an agriculture guest worker visa program for Kansas. I have 70,000 jobs in the state dependent upon an agriculture guest worker visa. That need, means we need immigration reform. I can't even talk about immigration reform without mentioning first we need to secure the border. To me it's one problem. The economy, immigration, uh, how immigration impacts the schools, how it impacts the hospitals, all, all those things, and securing the border, to me that's all one problem. And the mistake I see lots of politicians and the national media do is talk about each one of them in isolation. But as a CEO, as a person, as a physician who looks at the human body, I want to know more than your blood pressure and your oxygen saturation. I want to know your sodium, your potassium, your x-rays, your MRIs, and then come up with a solution for, for the problem. So number one, we need to secure the border. I've been to the border. It is a crisis. It's a national security crisis and a humanitarian crisis. Why do I say that? I think that th these facts are indisputable. There's lots of facts they're arguing about on national media, but I think these are indisputable. Every night we're housing, feeding, and giving health care to 40,000 people. It's just a huge tax on our system. I talked to the doctors from DHS uh, two weeks ago. They met with the Doc Caucus. The Doc Caucus, there's nine physicians in Congress, ex-physicians that are, that are in Congress. We get together at least once a week. We've been cranking it up, working on the President's health care plan. Uh, but we had DHS doctors come and talk to us about just trying to manage, you know, who's got tuberculosis, who's got measles, who's got mumps, hepatitis, just trying to assess that. We were averaging 2,000 people crossing the border illegally a day. The past month, it's 3,000 people crossing it illegally every day. I was horrified of the sex trafficking going on. I had no idea. The easiest way to get into this country is to be, if you go through the border with a, a child, son or daughter with you, you it's a much easier to check the boxes and get caught and released, right? So 12, 14, 16 year old girls and boys selling themselves to the coyotes who were transporting them in exchange for getting them through the border, selling their bodies, and then selling them into, into sex trafficking. Uh, I mean, that to me, that's the humanitarian crisis. Uh, the national security crisis, there's no way we can vet the 3,000 people crossing our borders every day illegally and the four or 5,000 that, that we're processing every day. You just can't properly vet those people for your safety. Uh, and then throw on two tons of illegal drugs coming across the border every day. So I was talking about jobs, but it's connected to border security. I can't fix immigration and then come back in 10 years and have DACA part three, or whatever the problem is. I need to secure the border so I can fix DACA, so I can give us an agriculture guest worker visa. Now, what can we do? What can we do? We need to make sure that the youth of today are ready for the jobs of today. And the answer is right here in our backyard. We have the greatest community colleges and technical colleges in the world. We need to make sure that our school systems are making sure that our sophomores in high school are plugged into those community colleges and technical colleges. And maybe they get a three hour class that, that year, their junior year maybe, they pick up another six credits in their senior year, maybe another nine credits. So they're graduating from high school and they're already on their way to a great job. Now I was fortunate I got a college degree from Kansas State University and KU Med Center, but a lot of the jobs open now are a technical skill. That if you can finish uh, the wind energy program in Concordia, you're going to get offered a seventy or eighty thousand dollar a year job. Uh, all across the country, we need welders and plumbers and people that can shingle roofs and, and run an asphalt machine. The aircraft industry in Wichita, people retiring faster than we can move them into the system. K State Salina, great opportunities there in the Technical Institute of Salina. Uh, closest community colleges to here, where would, where would you all? Salina has a great technical college, probably the closest one I can think of. Uh, it's not too far up the way to Beloit Concordia. Oh, yeah. Cloud, to Cloud County, <coughs> Concordia, exactly. So that's what we can do. We, we need to make sure that our kids of today realize those are great jobs. Have something to be very proud of and you can graduate with zero debt and have a great job, and then maybe those people go back and get a master's degree or you know, a business degree and then an MBA or whatever it is. But I think it's something that we need to keep emphasizing. Uh, there's something called a Perkins Grant, which helps fund that, and the state also has funds that they're funding that program as well through. 
So, you know, my job, figure out what's working, emphasize uh, what's working, and do more of it. And if it's not working, then go a different direction. So I'll stop there. And i um, excited to be here and listen to your comments or questions. If you don't mind, stand up. For my sake, it'd help me if you tell me your name and maybe who you're with. Uh, and, if it's, and lots of times it's just you as Joe Citizen as opposed to part of the something, something, I get that too. But willing to hear a couple questions or comments. Yes, sir. I, I, you uh, mentioned the party wind energy program, and I think that's great. There was a story in the Abilene paper about the uh, wind farm down in Marion County, and apparently it's, it's providing a lot of energy to Kansans. Uh, but recently, I've heard the president mocking wind energy at his rallies. I wonder if you've heard that. Do you think that's helpful? And would you possibly have a word with him? Would you tell me that you're going to have a word with him to express how you, how you feel about whether that's helpful or not? Okay. So I, I'm you. not. Thank you for being here. You're welcome. So I'm not here. I mean, personally not heard the president speak ill of wind energy. Um, I believe in an all of the above policy on energy. I think diver diversification is great no matter what industry you're in. Kansas, about 35% of our energy generated from wind, and now we're exporting it. I love to sell something to, to Texas, and we're going to soon be selling energy to Chicago. I love when Kansas can do something and we can make money off of other states, so I'm very proud of our wind energy program, uh, and I lead one of the caucuses on it. And I, I'm sorry, I didn't... I didn't uh, Introduce myself. My name is Scott Crusoe, and I am a constituent here. Thanks, and, but when you speak to the president about that, do you feel his comment? I mean, I guess you said you didn't hear it. But will you speak to him about that and tell him how important that is to to uh, energy production here in Kansas? You know, I would say this. My my time with the president is very finite, and I, I pick and choose my subjects really carefully. And wind energy is in a pretty good spot right now. There's rhetoric, and then there's policy, and wind energy is in a pretty good policy spot right now as, as well. Okay. Yes, All right. Back to one yes, sir. For the last probably 20 or 30 years, we've been told that Social Security is going broke. <laughs> what is your plan to save it, and what is your timetable for introducing that plan? Great. You know, I think number one is that we're not going to touch anybody's Social Security or Medicare. Anybody that's on it right now or is close to going on it, we're not going to touch that. But you're right, it's unsustainable to keep doing what we're doing. And much like President Reagan back in 1992 called upon the Moth Dole to save Social Security and make some tweaks there, I think that's what um, is Congress will have to do this time as well. You know, a, a timetable? Um, to, be, to, be, to be frank, if it's not on President Trump's to-do list, there's just not much happening up there right now. Um, I think he's more focused on several other issues, build the wall, uh, infrastructure, fixing health care. And so I'm supposing that's going to be my timetable. Um, I don't like to waste my time, so my timetable is probably President Trump gets reelected, so sometime after that. He does not introduce legislation. I understand that, but he can veto anything else. Yes, he could. I could not envision him vetoing anything to do with saving Social Security. You have not answered the question about how to save it. So, you know, try to answer it again. I think I have, but I'll try to answer it again. You know, several thoughts. Number one is I'm shocked how small amount of oxygen there is in Washington, D.C. for any type of issues. And as long as Nancy Pelosi and the Democrats want to just make a mockery of justice and continue to try the president over and over again, nothing's happening. So I don't think there's enough oxygen to take on the problem right now, nor are they interested in taking it on. So I'm a very much a realist. Last year on the House side, we passed over 800 pieces of legislation that were never even taken up on the Senate side. So I'm not going to waste my time trying to fix the problem today um, when, I, when, we, when I got other issues up in front of me. The way we, we're going to have to fix it is I don't think a 25-year-old can expect to, to get some of these uh, things starting at age 65. Uh, when Medicare and Social Security were started, the life expectancy was in the, what, 62 or 63? Who would have thought that now people are going to spend 20 or 30 years in retirement? So I don't think a young person can expect to get all these benefits. Here's something else I'm going to do to fix it, though, even more importantly. 
28% of the federal budget is being spent on health care. A big chunk of that, of course, is Medicare, Medicaid, and the VA system. We have to drive the cost of health care down, which according to small businesses is the number one problem. So next you should ask me how are you going to drive the cost of health care down. Three basic principles. Transparency, innovation, and consumerism. We need to make health care more transparent. We get more information when we go to a restaurant and get a menu than we do for our health care. So back in January, the president asked all hospitals to share their cost. Um, and this caused, created a big uproar. The hospitals don't want to do that. And then they said it wasn't a good way to do it, that the cost master was uh, deceiving. And my question was, so what do you want to share? What type of information can you share with the public? And so far, nothing but crickets out of the hospitals. So I need their transparency, physicians, anyone who delivers health care need to be more transparent. I'll give you one really important example. Nothing's went up faster than the cost of pharmacy. There's something called a pharmacy benefit manager, which is basically a wholesale organization. There's only four of them in the country. They're controlling 90% of prescriptions. So if you go to your local pharmacist here, and say it costs $100 for that prescription, that pharmacy benefit manager is getting $33 of that. Then they're giving legal kickbacks to big pharma and insurance companies. The Americans, we deserve to see that. Number one, I don't think it's right. And I think that all types of discounts and coupons, all the games are playing should go to the customer. So that's probably the best thing that I do. That's what I know how to do is to drive the cost of health care down. May I give you one a solution? Yes, sir. Currently, uh, once you reach $127,000 in income, you pay no more into Social Security. You drop the cap on that. Why does somebody who earns $100 million a year not pay Social Security on that amount above 127? I get it. It's really the Democrats would certainly get it, get behind that. I totally get it, and I think that's part of the, that would be part of the solution. Absolutely. Thanks. Yes, sir. Doc, how's it going? Stage four, you retired position. Any, any bit closer to making pharmacy transparent, to make them come out and show how much profit they make, how, w w to, to, to ask them to justify 100%, 200%, 1,000% price increases and stuff, and controlling them? Can't you? At, at a, and and I, think, I think the cost of drugs went up exponentially when uh, drug insurance came along because they knew the, the patient wasn't going to pay for the drug, it was going to be the insurance company that paid for the drug so they could increase their price, get money from the insurance company that then the patient, you know, if you had to pay cash, why then you were penalized for that. Can't you control those guys at all? I mean, I know that, I know that for every congressman, there's, for every person in Congress, there's what, 10 drug representatives, lobbyists for each one? It, it, it's a huge number, and, 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 and campaigns are run on huge amounts of money from drug companies. And, and so I understand why they don't want to be controlled, I mean, how, how they can get out of being controlled by Congress. You have a president in charge of controlling, but only doing little things over here and over there. Why, why can't you put some teeth into it? Uh, you know, a couple thoughts. Of the 300 different organizations that have contributed to our campaign, I can only think of two that are pharmacies. But, but I, I maybe have missed a couple. Um, number next is a lot, of the, a lot of the things that the president has done is actually so down the cost of pharmacy. So I think my number's right that pharmacy only went up about 1% this past year. A lot of the policy is driven at, uh, number one, is how to make more generics. So if there's more generics available, more competition, it drives the price down. So the FDA under President Trump is doubling the number of generic pharmacy drugs being approved every year. So we, we doubled those. The next thing we try to do is help the FDA figure out ways to streamline the process of, of approval of a drug. So it takes a billion dollars and 10 years for a drug to go through the FDA process. Realizing that drug's already probably been in development for 10 years before it even gets to, to the FDA. So we're trying to work uh, to streamline that. And one particular thing that we've got done is called the Right to Try Act. So if you have a terminal illness, 
and a drug has made it through phase one of the FDA process, that you have a right to try that drug. So the, the secret is getting more competition at the pharmacy levels so that it'll drive the cost down. So it's amazing. It, doesn't, it can't be just two drugs, though. We need three or four competitors on the market. I've seen great graphs that show that's what drives the price down is when there's three or four drugs to competition. So my solution has always been to promote competition and transparency as opposed to government price control. The president has suggested that we consider some price controls, um, but I don't think that's um, a very capitalistic way to look at it. I do think that pharmacy has done some incredible things for innovation. So I think we've, we've made some progress on my transparency pres uh, prescription. We, get, we do have several legislation out there for transparency. Nancy Pelosi will never see, let us see the light of day. And it's amazing to me is when I started getting behind this that not only the, the pharmacy benefit managers have come after me, but, but big insurance companies, the American Hospital Association don't like me anymore. So all these, these great big companies who have done so well under Obamacare, I'm now on their list. Um, pharmacy wasn't happy with me either because I'm going after this. Big pharma. So I don't think I'm their best friend either. I don't think the doc caucus is their best friend. Points taken up. I promise not to give so long of answers if it's not health care. <laughs> Go ahead. Hi, Andrew, Andrew from and I live here in Abilene. Um, I might be um, similar to AOC. The president was not exonerated, number one. And it's shown on the TV screen, not exonerated. So please don't repeat his comment that he is exonerated. It's not the truth. Number two, the children down by the wall are in cages and they are being sexually exploited by their caregivers. That's the emergency down there. There are people down there that need asylum coming to this country, which is legal, and instead, this whole thing of the Department of Homeland Security is making it worse. These people are ex escaping from dangerous situations in their um, countries down south, which we helped create because we moved in there and helped um, put in despotic kinds of rulers instead of who they had democratically elected. Um, we need to have Medicare for all, not transparency, um, little things. We need to stop endless war. We are going all around the world and putting in bases and um, harming people in other countries that we have no reason to be there except that they have oil and they have resources. We need to not be doing that. Spend less on your military budget and you've got Medicare for all covered. You've got education with um, free college or cheaper college for everyone. Uh, help people instead of harm people. This number 45 has done more damage, including the GOP, by allowing there to be dirty air and dumping coal ash into the water. I don't think you would want your patients drinking coal ash, would you? I don't think you'd want to have junk in the air that children are suffering from asthma, including myself, because there's not kind of clean air standards. Um, the president is being investigated for 17 other issues which have nothing to do with the Mueller investigation. So please don't say he's exonerated. He is not. No, it's really appreciate your comments. Just because CNN puts up something that says not exonerated, well, that's that, that, I listen to you. I listen, I listen to you. I listen to you. Will you listen to me now? Yes. Sure. Okay. So just because CNN puts up they're not exonerated, doesn't make it true. This whole investigation was about collusion. That's what this was supposed to investigate. The report clearly says no collusion. There was no collusion. And if there's no collusion, there can't be obstruction of justice. If there's no collusion, there was no intent to make a crime. If he didn't make a crime, how, could, how can there be collusion? He's fully exonerated. Can we please move on? See, this is just it. They're just going to keep this drowning. You know what this is going to mean? This is going to mean President Trump's going to get reelected in 2020 because Americans are sick and tired of this, just continuing this drama. That he's being tried on national TV every night. You know, can, can we please move on? Uh, you know, the other issues you brought up, I would say this. We have a lot of the same goals. I want everybody to have health care. But Obamacare has been a miserable failure. The most miserable failure I've ever seen in my life. 10 million people, or actually 9 million people, 
on Obamacare, the state exchanges right now. 28 million people still don't have health care. I think that both Democrats and Republicans now, we both want to repeal Obamacare. You know, every major Democrat candidate for president wants to repeal Obamacare and re replace it with Medicare for all. Medicare for all is Medicare for none. You should be, if you're on Medicare now and you hear them talk about it, it should scare you to death. It's going to look like Medicaid. People will be standing in line to get their health care. You won't get your joint procedure done for two years. You won't be able to get your MRI. If you get your health insurance through your employer, it's the end of that. If you get health care through the VA, it's the end of that as well. It would triple your taxes. Do I need to go on? I believe that patients and families and doctors should make health care choices. Um, and I think that we want quality outcomes. We agree upon that. We want cleaner air. I agree with you. The air of Kansas is cleaner today than when I was growing up. I'm going to keep moving in that direction. The carbon output of this country has been on a nice steady decrease since 2004. Let's keep going in that direction, but let's don't throw the baby out with the bathroom. I'll let you respond. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I disagree with you extraordinarily. Um, we're one of the only sort of um, sophisticated countries in the world that doesn't have health care for its citizens compared to Britain and France and Canada. And, you know, it, 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 that's kind of crazy. Um, I don't know. I, I'm sorry. I know you believe what you believe. And, um, the Mueller report that got described um, on mass media as well as some other media was that the bar um, description says that he was not exonerated and um, that there, the um, investigation was just to see if there was collusion with Russia. But I am in agreement with Adam Schiff. I don't know if you caught his talk the other day where he did not agree with what the GOP was allowing to happen in terms of all this um, misbehavior. Um, the, the president's uh, group of people, his son, and meeting with the Russians and asking Russia to help him with the election. I mean, he's. This is not a president that I will be having to call my president. He's not my president. He's a duly elected president. And there's also, it's interesting that uh, most people in Congress, certainly the Republicans think Schiff should resign, that he's so biased and spreads so much false information. But let's move on. Go ahead. Roger, Harold for toys from Memorial Health System. Um, I think that one thing I would like to say is that the 340B is very important. 340G Pharmacy is very important to uh, prescriptions and reduction of prices. We're able to do it in-house and with our retail pharmacies as well. So any help you can continue to give us for 340B if you can. <coughs> and I appreciate the support you've given them today. So. Right. So we've been a big fan of 340B and I certainly understand how it's helped small hospitals. You know, the, the problem is big hospitals like Duke University have made good millions, if not billion dollars on it, so they took a good program and did some bad things with it. Yeah. And so again, I'm trying to not throw the baby out with the bath water. So it's, I'm going to try to protect it for small hospitals, but I can't protect it from the big hospitals who are abusing the system. And I think that's, it's very disappointing to me that the American Hospital Association can't tell the difference because we are going to get the baby thrown out in the bath water if they don't try to carve this out just for small hospitals. So, but thank you. I, certainly all my critical access. Are you guys critical access? We are. Critical all, all of them think this is a very vital thing. It's been a great thing. And it's, well, it's been great for our patients, especially, and it's reduced their cost. So I think that's important. And I think that's an example of pharmacy trying to respond, <laughs> trying to do the right thing. So, Tim, 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 Tim with the local she brought up the kids in cages. Yeah. So, what do we do with them? Send yeah, them back to possibly a life they don't want to live. Yeah, so I, I think that's, so again, I've been to the border. I didn't see kids in cages. Okay. I went to the border and they showed, I went into a camp. I played soccer with the kids. Um, it was a tent city, but it was the most beautiful tent city I've ever seen. Uh, it was nicer than anything we could give for our military. You know, it's air conditioned. Uh, right, they got showers, they got heat. They've got a physician, they've got nurses, they've got psychologists, they've got a dentist. 
They're getting better care than my kids get. In a cage. I, I didn't see these cages. You're, I didn't see these cages you're talking about. Obama photos. Obama administration. Yeah. So I, I don't. So you should go to the, you should go to the board your, your, yourself. Okay. And so I, I didn't see kids in cages. Um, I, all I can do is my personal experiences. I didn't see that. Um, but we were just inundated with them. And most of these kids had been sent by their parents from Central America. Their story was almost exactly the same. They paid a coyote five, seven thousand dollars. They said, cross the border illegally, let the Americans capture you. We want the Americans to capture you because as soon as that happens, you get great health care, you're going to get food and water, uh, access to telephones, and then call Uncle Joe in wherever he lives and they'll try to work out how to get, get you there. Um, the asylum system is broken. The problem with the asylum is that for every 100 people that ask for asylum, maybe only 10 or 15 are legitimate. The fact that there's not a job for you back home is not a reason for asylum. Um, so I, I want to solve the problem. It's not simple. We're just we're overwhelmed right now. So you get a question yeah. next. Go ahead. How many average here, um, like remember the Veterans of Foreign Wars and also the American Legion. And our big concern last year was uh, health care through the VA, hospitals, improvements, doctors and all. Are we health, any healthier now this year than we were last year? Yeah, I'm gonna, how do you, compared to three or four years ago, how do you think we're doing with veterans health? I think we're doing a little better. It seems to be and some of the guys are less complainful as they come to our meetings and stuff. So they, before, they were, they were not getting treated. Sometimes they would show up for an appointment and be turned away. And when they do that, they don't get paid for that travel. But now they're paying them for the travel even if they don't get to see a doctor that day. So that's pretty, I think it's being better. But also on the government side, as far as health care, as far as our, 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 our healthy air solution, the government has gotten rid of all those old five ton old trucks that we used to drive that smoke, this black smoke poured down it as you're going down the highway, you know. Even Germany complained about us having those old snacks, nasty trucks. So our health care government is trying to help the health care by giving us healthier trucks. You see, you see the convoys now. The trucks don't smoke. They re-burn their fuel. The engines do. And also, they're taking care of the water. We, 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 Abilene needs a new water system here because it, the system is so old, it's almost like drawing it through a rope off a bucket. Wow. Okay. Uh, I meant to introduce Tyler Mason. Tyler, wave your hand. So Tyler's my veterans of very military person, and all he does is try to make sure to work with veterans for the most part, and my, my liaison with Fort Riley as well. Um, I met with the secretary of uh, the Veterans Administration just last week in the doc caucus. We asked him to come in and talk to us. So patient satisfaction is up and going in, a, in the right direction. The length of wait for appointments is getting better. I think about you know, what this president has done since taking over, number one is Congress is spending twice as much money on veterans today than they were under the Obama administration. Um, we've allowed you to get more health care done at home through both the, um, uh, the, the, mission, the Mission Act, what was on before the Mission Act? What was it called, Tyler? Choice. The, so Choice Act, and then, and then the Mission Act is new and improved and trying to make it even better. So you go to your local hospital, your local doctor, and get health care done uh, as well. Uh, we also have about, I think, 11 veterans clinics now throughout the state, so you wouldn't have to necessarily drive all the distance. I think the next piece of the puzzle is mental health. What are we, are we doing enough for veterans' mental health? I was just in Wichita at the Robert Dole Veterans Center there, and we broke dirt on an 8-bed or 12-bed inpatient center, which is not a whole lot of noise so to have that many beds, but I really think uh, telemedicine has got great opportunities uh, for veterans. I can't get my psychiatrist, mental health people to go throughout the state, but it's pretty easy to, if you would walk into one of these 11 clinics, I see everybody in Kansas is probably within 60 miles of one of those clinics, and be able to hook up with telemedicine and follow you through some of the unique uh, mental health challenges for our veterans as well. So I think we're trying, it's not perfect, I think it's going in the right direction. Um, you know, several years ago, I was ready just to blow up the VA. I just didn't think it could ever be fixed. 
but uh, the president's Fire proven me wrong. And part of it's accountability. We passed this accountability legislation, and I forget how many hundreds of people that work for the VA system have been let go. So we're trying. And if you feel like it's going the wrong day, let Tyler know. Yes, sir. Real quick question, and it might relate to you a little bit. Recently, two of my wife's uh, generic drugs have been recalled. Do the pharmacies know the country of origin for those generic drugs? Oh, I would think so. I would think so. When she asked the pharmacy, they wouldn't or couldn't tell her. Okay. There should be. I would, I would just almost bet that the, the, the company that, that, that it, maybe they didn't have access to that data, I but I couldn't imagine. I bet they don't know. Okay. I'm pretty sure. Wow. You don't think the I don't think the pharmacies know, not the, not the local ones here. No. Is there a reason for that? The drug company controlled by pharma. Yeah, it's not. It's not. The, it's not the retail. Yeah, you have to realize they're two separate entities, and so if you confuse them to be one, that would be wrong. Retail is a completely different group. I, what I'm saying is, I bet Parma knows. I bet somebody knows where it's yeah. made. Yeah. yeah. But the consumer may not. Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, Stephen Gabar with the Kansas Council on Developmental Disabilities, and I want to thank you for the social impoverishment uh, bill that you, you guys just passed out of the House. We still need to get money. Follows the person legislation renewed. And uh, I'd also like to have you, uh, I do want to mention that my job takes me to, to D.C. And I appreciate the fact that you always visit with me whenever I do come up there. That doesn't happen with everyone else that's up there. Um, and, uh, but I would like to talk a little bit about the opioid crisis. Can you address some of the opioid yeah. issues? Right. Where do I start? <laughs> 150 people die every day from uh, opioid overdose. I'm, I'm close. Maybe it's 170. It's over. So it's a big deal. 150 people dying from it. And again, things that, that I can do at the at the federal level, things that we can do, things that physicians and hospitals can do as well. I think we can solve the problem better working locally without the government telling us exactly what to do. But let me talk about the federal level. Some things we've done. I think first of all, we've allocated over five billion dollars specifically for the opioid issues. I'm really curious if we're just going to we're going to throw this money at the problem or how it's going to be utilized. I'm really concerned that three people in Abilene are going to throw a sign on the front door that says "drug rehab here," uh, qualify for the money, he's burned through it, and then that patient ends up at Larded Health. Okay. Next thing we've done: 90% of the fentanyl, a synthetic narcotic, is made in China. 90%. Uh, this drug is so strong that when the drug dog sniffs it, it kills them. It's 50 strong, times stronger than uh, other drugs that I can prescribe. So most of the people that are dying on an overdose are taking this one. They, take, they used to take six or eight Percocets to get high. If anybody in this room took two fentanyls, we'd stop breathing. That's what happens. You overdose on narcotics, people don't realize it. You just stop breathing. Um, so, and guess, a lot of those were coming in through our U.S. Post Office. I was crying. And we didn't know where it was coming from. We didn't know where, and then we find it was coming from China. Well, we're in China. So President Trump, as part of this negotiations, has insisted that the Chinese have a higher criminal uh, level for people that make, get caught making that in China. So to, to there, they're just turning their eyes on and say, oh great, the dumb Americans will buy this. It's a great crop and you can make it in your garage. So, so those are a, a couple things that we're doing. Next is uh, we need to stop looking as opioid addiction over here and mental health issues over here. It's all this thing, there's a lot of overlap. If you have a mental health issue, you're more likely to get addicted to opioids. And if you get addicted to opioids, you're going to have a mental health issue. Okay? Things that we can do. I, I think as physicians, we've taken a close look at it, and we've learned that we can do a better job. We don't need to send people home with 40 Percocets because they had their two teeth pulled. Um, I think we've discovered that the Oxycontin was way more addictive than we thought we were told it was. So I think the physicians have looked themselves in the mirror. I think the hospitals have looked in the mirror and are trying to figure out things that we can do better as well. Can we manage intraoperative and postoperative pain better with non-narcotics or at least not as much? We were getting dinged. One of the things that the federal government was doing as a indicator is how much pain you were having after surgery. Okay. 
and we would get decreased reimbursement if our scores weren't good. When I saw that happening, all of a sudden, my patients were just snockered when I, when I went back to the post-op recovery room. I mean, I'm not kidding you, the first, and, the, and they had the pain score as well. And um, so there's several things that happened that went awry. So I think we're trying to address those as, you know, look in the mirror, what can we do? Things that we can do at the federal level, and, and this as well. Now, I still believe that right now in Kansas, meth and cocaine are a bigger problem than opioids. But Joe Manchin is a great friend of mine, a senator from West Virginia, and what he describes is horrible. Uh, so I, I, think, I think we've turned the barometer towards fixing it. Um, and there's so many people addicted. I don't think we have a, we could solve that completely. We got number one to stop the bleeding and slow down the number of addicted people. Um, I, I think the telemedicine will be another thing that, that can benefit from this as well. Yes, sir. I'm here slang, I look back and hang up. Can we do anything for sanctuary cities? They do more to cripple law enforcement than anything I can think of. You know, I, I think administratively what we're trying, what the president's trying to do is cut their funding. And of course, whenever you threaten the, the city's funding, uh, then it's then we're hurting widows and orphans. You know, that would be the national media attention that we get. So I think what we can do is tie federal funding to people who claim to be sanctuary cities. And we have no sanctuary cities in Kansas. I think that's a miss uh, printing in a couple of communities. That's, all, that's the only thing I can think of. Yes, sir. Yeah, you, uh, you said that Medicare for all, if we had that, it would be Medicare for none. But they don't seem to have that problem in Canada or in the UK or in Finland or any other developed country. So why is it in the greatest country in the world, the richest country in the world, we can't have Medicare for all? And wouldn't that take a huge burden off of small businesses? They wouldn't have to worry about insurance for their employees. You know, I, I think again, disagree with the premise. Most. Many, many people in all those countries also have a secondary insurance. So basically, that their Medicare for all basically covers catastrophic things. It looks a lot like Medicaid. And I think that their waiting lists are really long, so it's rationed care. Uh, so they ration the care, they, you know, but you fall and break your hip in the nursing home. And the hope is that they wait long enough to just die uh, if you don't take care of it right away. So I, so I think that it's just, if, it, I think other countries should, this is still the best health care, we have the best health care in the world. Uh, we're the, we have the innovations. Why, why does America have all the innovations in health care? Why are we able to cure cancer in so many cases? Why do we have heart stents? The National Institute of Health for one reason, because we fund research. Our government, the federal funds research into, into okay. drugs and other uh, health care benefits, do they not? Yeah, of course. See, I'm not sure the second one you said, but so yes, we, we fund the NIH. It's a great institution. Um, the uh, 21st Century Cures Act. We we added increased funding for research. So I'm all about research. But eventually, the innovators of the world are not sitting in the government office. The innovators of the world are out in the private world of of entrepreneurs. Look, I'm a very lucky man. I I recently had a heart attack. It was a, it was a minimal. But the bill was $70,000. I have insurance through my employer, uh, through my retirement plan. I am very lucky. I know most people don't have that benefit. And that bill would wipe out. That's more than a, that's, most people can't afford a, a $500 emergency bill, much less $70,000. That, that, something's got to be done. And this, uh, this idea that what we need is to make it easier for insurance companies to make more profit. I think it's the wrong direction. Well, certainly under Obamacare, we saw insurance companies double, triple, quadruple their profits. No one's done better through Obamacare than big insurance companies have. So they've certainly benefited from it. Meanwhile, under Obamacare, we've seen the average premium uh, double and the average uh, deductible watt went up exponentially. So certainly the direction we've been going is not the, not the solution. You had a question in here, sir? Yes, I thought how we oversaw uh, retire utility uh, and now involved in farming operation. Uh, you started your remarks with discussion about uh, uh, farmers and their support for uh, the 
trade positions that we're working on. And I think for the most part, I would agree with that, but I do want you to know that the time is of the essence. So that, uh, uh, that patience is starting to wear thin uh, when we hear, uh, we should be hearing uh, good news in a couple of weeks. Well, we've been hearing good news is coming for a couple of months. And I can tell you that, that our, uh, the young operator that, that takes care of our farm in Southeast Kansas for me, uh, him and his family and many like him are nearing yes, sir. that critical point where uh, it can't last much longer or we will be back to the 1980s. The only difference between then and now yes. is interest rates, 6% versus 18%. But my question is, much of this is driven by trade. So besides the China issue, what do you think the timeline might be on the uh, USMCA? Because that is a very, very big deal. And then obviously the, uh, the EU and Japan and so others that need a team. Right, right. So certainly every time I'm with the, the president or the secretary of agriculture, the USTR, I've tried to impress upon them the, how serious this is and the, the timing of it. And I don't think you've ever heard from me that we're weeks away from the solution um, with China until, well, understand. until the past that's, month. That's, that's absolutely. Well, in, in general terms. Yeah, absolutely. So certainly, we're already knee deep working with the European Union and with Japan as well. And what people don't realize, Trump is actually a great negotiator. <laughs> Uh, one of the things he did in the USMCA is he talked about gene editing in that, in that agreement. And we didn't need that as much with Canada and with Mexico as we do with the European Union. So for over six months, the European Union has said, we want to renegotiate trade with you, but we want to exclude agriculture. So my job has been to beat the drum to tell the president, no agriculture, no agreement. If they want to send their Mercedes Benz here and their Jaguars, great but you have to include agriculture. They don't want any part of us because there's just certain things we can do in this country better than they can do. Maybe they can make uh, a sports car better than we can, but we can sure as heck grow corn and wheat cheaper and better than they can. It just and because we've been blessed with this incredible country we live in. So working hard on the European Union, uh, Japan very critically important, and I'll, I'll tell you why. The one bright market, one bright spot in agriculture is the exports of beef to Japan and Southeast Asia. Uh, Japan recently signed an agreement with Australia, so their tariff is about to fall from 27 to 9 percent, and America's is at 38 percent. Right now, J Japanese are very willing to pay that extra tariff difference because our beef is, tastes better than Australian. Imagine that. Yeah, but when it's 38 versus 9, maybe not so much. Um, so again, those negotiate the timing. I mean, I think that those are still a year away from getting done. USMCA, we're waiting for the president to give us the agreement, the final law changes that are required, and then it's going to take six months to get it through Congress. Um, and I just hope that Nancy Pelosi doesn't play politics and keep us from voting on it. Um, so that was that one, which was, India is one you didn't mention. I think there's great opportunities in India. Ted McKinney uh, is working very hard in opening some of those markets up as, uh, as well. The, I, I, the timing, I, you know, all these things take months and years as opposed to days and weeks. Uh, I think you say Evelyn here. Uh, I just want to mention that you are right on uh, Medicare. I grew up in Germany and my siblings still live there and they all have uh, additional insurance. Uh, if you don't, then you have, you're in a bed with three or five people. Uh, you get the PA rather than the MD. Uh, you have to wait three or four months to get special appointments. Uh, this is a great myth that everyone will be equal. There's great inequality in that uh, system. Now, every system is somewhat different, but also Finland, those countries, they have 70% tax rates. I mean, it, is, it sounds wonderful, and yes, everyone deserves good health care, but we need to really see the big picture on that. Uh, secondly, I would like to mention it must be very difficult for legislators to work in this toxic, toxic atmosphere in Washington, and we appreciate that you try. Um, thirdly, 
what would it take for Congress to work together to get something done? I'm worried about our young people to grow up in this divisive, uh, nasty uh, atmosphere. What example are we setting for our youth? So what will it take for adults to get together for the good of the country? No Donuts. <laughs> <laughs> chocolate something, it was really good. Yeah. Yeah. Any, anyway, Inga, um, there's not one solution. I think we have to, why is it so toxic? So let's go to the root of the disease. Why is it to, so toxic? A, a couple comments that I've, that I've tried to understand is um, social media, our ability to get just the news we want to listen to. Uh, you know, you used to listen to Walter Conkright, and I think he presented, here's the news, it was not an editorial. When I listen to the news today, the national news media, what I made, the decision I made at 9 a.m., they decided by 5 p.m. if it was right or wrong or not. And I think about President Eisenhower. I share this every time I get people a tour. And I know I'm, I, here I am in Abilene, but honest to goodness, when President Eisenhower finished as president, they said, oh, he's the 32nd best president ever, but now historians think he's one of the top five. Because the decisions he made took decades to come to fruition. So this idea of short-sightedness that if my only goal is I'm a professional politician, my only goal is to get re-elected, then I make different decisions than I think what's best for the country. Um, number two, with social media, when social me media came, became so strong and all of a sudden national networks started chasing headlines as opposed to content. They were struggling, going bankrupt. So what I've noticed is the more, most outland, the more outlandish things I say or the people who say the most outlandish things on either side are the ones that go on TV. So as long as we keep feeding into that, as long as those uh, national uh, cable news syndicates or the top TV shows and America keeps buying it and watching it, I guess that keeps happening. Um, yeah. Does the national news miss him go to him? <laughs> they probably do. <laughs> I'm sure he sold, sold a few, few ads as well. So, so he, all, all I can do is one person at a time. Um, someone adds, I told someone, really, I'm trying to have a relationship with every member of Congress, and they said it's impossible, but I'm trying. Absolutely trying. I've shared before, every Tuesday night I have dinner with about 25 uh, senators and congressmen from both sides of the aisle. Every Thursday morning, 60, 70 of us a prayer breakfast from both sides of the aisle. I've sat down with every Democrat on the House Ag Committee. I've sat down with every Democrat who worked in health care uh, before they came to Congress to talk about health care solutions. So I'm going to keep reaching and trying one person at a time. Is that, is that too much power in the Speaker of the House and, and, the, and the majority leader in the Senate? Do they set, the, do they set your agenda? Absolutely they do. They control it. So it's and just a few people? So I do think that it's, it's worse at the top. What I've learned about the speaker or the majority leader, it's not so much just what they put on the House floor, it's what they don't put on the House floor. So, so two years ago, a group of us went to Paul Ryan and said, we want to do the internet sales tax legislation. I know it would have passed, but he refused to put it on the House floor. Never told me why. Um, but, but it does, they really controlling the gavel in those committees and, and being the speaker and majority leader is absolutely huge because it sets the agenda. And I, and we elected those people. Yeah, Tim. Tim. You're with one? Okay. No. All right. I think we beat it to death. You guys want to? Probably you're, you're hungry. I hope you feel like I answered your questions. I'm honored to represent you, and we'll keep working at it. Thank you.